kittens. You're not kittens anymore, but... He says probably won't come in here just because you is a stranger to him. I am not a stranger. I helped rescue him. No, but he's pretty old now. I don't think he'll remember that. He's probably like four or five. I don't know. No, no. maybe not that old. Anyway, um... All right, whenever you're ready. What up, yo? <laughs> <laughs> trying to trying to one up uh, Nero, Nero on, the, on the yo what? Yeah. I mean, um. if, uh, <laughs> you're, you're, da- you're doing it. You're killing oh, it. Oh gosh. Okay. Well, maybe I should tone it down a little. <laughs> hey guys. Um. <laughs> that seems more your speed. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Stay in your lane. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try. Um. This is a uh, new script on the block, uh, but more specifically, before the scene. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. <laughs> I am not sick. I just have shit in my throat. I watched a YouTuber who did a video about COVID-19, and in it they said, and try to remember, guys, that clearing a throat is a normal thing that humans still do. <laughs> So if you're out and about and someone clears their throat, don't just death stare at them. Yeah, like stare at them. Like, Uh, oh my god, they have it? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Oh my gosh. We're going to be doing an episode of Before the Scene, and this time we're reading a scene from the film Toy Story 4. Yes. I'm just going to say this, and Mm -hmm. I'm okay if people fight me on it. Okay. Hands down. I like this Toy Story movie better than the third. (gasps) I know. (laughs) I think... The story of Buzz, Woody, Jesse, all of them came to a good end at three. Mm-hmm. And like that whole arc was was good was a good ending. Yeah. One, two, and three. Like it was conclusive. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> the Andy saga, if you will. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I don't know. I think I think because I was I I was going to college when this movie came out or was already in college, I related to it a little bit more. It hit more heavy mm-hmm. in my personal life. Mm-hmm. And it was just more of like yeah, I'm I'm in college. I'm I'm going away from that innocence of being a child and that just kind of hit a little more heavy. And then when it came out that they were like, oh yeah, we're going to make a Toy Story 4 and it's going to be about Woody going after Bo and trying to find her. And it's like, "Uh, but why? (laughs) But why? (laughs) Like, I don't know. It just, it to me felt like they made a story because people got... People ask questions. Yeah. Like what happened to Bo? And it's like, well, you know, she was Andy's toy, which then she he gave to his sister, Molly. And then, just like how Barbie, she grew out of her, yeah. and she was given away. That's what happens to toys. So it's like, we did. that's all we needed, was an explanation of, you know, she, she was, she was given away. And that's all that really needed to be said, instead of all of a sudden, like, Bo There's a becoming... whole movie dedicated yeah. to like, the vigilante Bo Peep. <laughs> yeah. But at the same time, I a little part of me is like, I'm I'm okay with what they did with Bo Peep. Yeah. Like, you know, she's she's out there and she's um living yeah. instead of just being a toy. Yeah. And that's something that hasn't been seen in a toy story you know yeah 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 so that was that was an interesting way that they took it there was an alternate scene where instead Mm -hmm. of it's the part where instead of gabby gabby being picked up by that little girl who's lost and and crying Mm -hmm. it's bo peep oh who gets picked up and she feels like she wants another owner again oh i don't like that (laughs) well yeah and that's why they changed it yeah so it's like do we want to, like, have her all of a sudden, like, change her? But then that would change, like, the whole ending of the of yeah. the story. So it's like, no, we we want it to be... We want Gabby Gabby's, like, arc yeah. to end here. I think that that's what made 
what I like, like one of the things I like most about this movie is that the quote unquote villain, like the ant- primary antagonist for the whole film, isn't actually a bad guy, like per se, which mm-hmm. was nice. Like we're, yeah. ta- we're, it's a person who has goals and ambitions that just happen to be in conflict with the protagonist's goals and ambitions, but they're not a bad guy. Like no, Gabby, Gabby getting that closure at the end I feel like was necessary for the audience because we actually cared about what happened to her because she was again like a antagonist that had depth and mm-hmm. wasn't just a bad guy well and then also you do you do feel bad for her that she's been she's been like looking at this little girl and wanting to make her happy like for the whole time she's been in the antique store to then be rejected by yeah. the only little girl she's that she's cared about yeah, yeah. It just is like, Ugh, oh, that yeah. sucks. It's a really shit moment. That is, that's terrible. Like, I, I feel bad for her. So it's like, you know, you, yeah. you do want to have her, like, it's redemption. Amazing so. how, like, children's films like this can have deep, complex themes that are so, like, subtly teaching kids real life stuff. Mm-hmm. Like, just because you want something and you work hard at it and mm-hmm. you do whatever it takes to get it doesn't mean you actually get what you want in the end and it it's not your fault like you could do everything right and not get what you want in the end because other people and what they want play a role in the things that happen in our lives and sometimes your expectations just don't align with everyone else's right yeah and it sucks but it's not your fault and as long as you acknowledge like hey I did what I could I didn't get what I wanted now I just have to move on to the next thing yeah yeah which is great and we get to see that that things work out for this character in the mm-hmm. end because, you know, she got back up and she did something. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Fun times at the Eshelman Estrell household. <laughs> Just go put explosion. <laughs> <laughs> Anywho, um, <clears throat> all um, right, so we're we're going to be reading from what page are we on? I um, pulled up. So we're going to be on page 70. Um, oh my god, this part is so funny. Like, I, <laughs> we haven't even started reading it yet, and I'm immediately, like, I, I just read a totally random line. I'm like, Margaret wanders down the aisle, notices the stuffed ducky and bunny, and immediately I'm like, nah. <laughs> <laughs> that, this is, and I think this is why, like, I wanted to see how they wrote this part because, oh, sure. I mean, in the in the movie, it's just very <laughs> what like <laughs> they're they're this this whole part just goes on. It, it's a good amount of time for them to 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 spend on this. But if you're yeah. thinking about it, like how they're delivering it, like how yeah. Ducky and Bunny are actually delivering it to Buzz and um, uh, Giggle, yeah. it's like. <laughs> Just, I just want to see their reactions of, this, like, what they're actually feeling. <laughs> I feel like this scene in particular, um, once we get into reading it, you'll know what we're talking about. But this scene in particular does a great job of subverting the audience's expectations to create really great comedic timing. Yeah. <laughs> um, which is awesome because we haven't gotten to read anything with this style of comedy mm-hmm. um, before on this show. And... Like, a lot of the writers, the guest writers we have on the podcast who are, like, local screenwriters, um, you know, they want to bring their best work. And for a lot of people, your best work tends to be something that is more on the serious side. And that's just because it hits topics that normally hit home for us more. Right. Um, But comedy is amazing in the way that you know a, a, a mass of people can enjoy and appreciate and relate to it well and also i feel like sometimes comedy is the hardest thing to write oh for sure because it's like i'm gonna just say it's very easy to make me laugh <laughs> <laughs> i'm i'm pretty easy to please as far as um jokes go i just love everything about this like reading a script that has like names like ducky <laughs> <laughs> giggle mcdimples yeah <laughs> like, that's, that's an actual <laughs> character's name in this man part of the reason why I, I liked this one is because like pixar's mm-hmm. gotten so good at depicting different textures 
Um, oh, this is an animation note. Okay. <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, yeah. I mean, the script has textural depth in oh, the sense sorry. that sorry, uh, no, the go way ahead. that the movie looks. Yes. Okay. Um, like you can definitely tell that. Um, Giggle McDimples is a small little, like, hard surface plastic. Yeah, like a Polly Pocket. Yeah. Oh, man. They nailed it. Like, yeah. I, I could see myself playing with this, this little toy. Polly Pocket, yeah. even though I know it's not Polly Pocket, but whatever. You know what I mean? Well, it is, though. It right? is. Yeah, like, they couldn't get the rights, but yeah. we knew what they were doing. Yeah. Same with, um, with Ducky and Bunny. <laughs> like... You could feel their weight yeah. and, like, how they moved. And there's a YouTube video that I remember watching. I think Matt was the one who was watching it. And I just happened to glance over how Toy Story feels different from other animated movies. Yeah. And it's because they shot it in a way that, it, like, the, the camera that they made inside the software mm -hmm. is mimicking a real-life camera. And it does absolutely, like perfect yeah everything and it's like you know that's why later on you see like when they're when um woody and Bo are looking at all the lights and everything and like how all the bouquet is yeah. all of that is 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 happening for real like they yeah. didn't have to do anything later on in that. post to yeah, do that the camera is acting like an actual camera before. right yeah and yeah. it's like that's oh, really cool man <laughs> oh. so much depth and they say animation's just yeah. for kids you mentioned something about, and I really like that note, you mentioned something about the weight of the characters. Like, mm. you can tell by the texture of their body, but also, like, I, I've i recently noticed, sorry, I've recently noticed um, in animation, like, even, um, I started watching Beastar, I think I mentioned that to you earlier. I started watching mm -hmm. Beastar, and this was something that I saw that they did, but also applicable to this film. When characters walk... I mm -hmm. love when each character has their own rhythm or pattern to how they walk. And yeah. it's affected by, again, like in this instance, we're looking at toys. So the way they walk is affected by the flexibility of their limbs based on the way that they're sewn or built mm -hmm. uh, or the type of, you know, plastic or fabric they're made from. Mm -hmm. The You can tell by the way they walk how much their body physically weighs. Mm -hmm. It's... Yeah, I I really enjoyed that element. Yeah. And then even, like, <laughs> just try and find any spot where Woody runs. <laughs> it's hilarious. <laughs> his arms are just flailing everywhere. <laughs> and, like, his head just goes side to side. It's it's hilarious. Yeah. Um, so but yeah, well that's, thought out and yeah. real. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, the animation's beautiful. If you haven't gone... gone and seen the movie. If you haven't watched the movie, go watch it. It's on Disney Plus now. Yeah. Um, if you don't have a Disney Plus, what are you doing with your life? <laughs> um, so meet us Get at it now. Yeah, meet us at page seventy. We're gonna read the script first. We'll give a quick review of that, and then we'll hop into the actual um, animation and and watch that. All right. Um, I can be uh, Buzz if you want to be Giggles McDimples. Okay. And do you want to be Duck or Bunny? <laughs> <laughs> okay so you're gonna be giggles okay bunny right or, yeah. or, are you are you duck or are you who knows <laughs> giggles bunny margaret okay giggles bunny margaret got it and i will be duck buzz and, buzz. and uh, narration? narration okay <clears throat> right. oh my gosh this is when we should have had all four of us i know but it's okay <laughs> it'll be fine i mean duck and bunny tell most of the story right? yeah that's true Okay. From a china cabinet across the way, Giggles, Buzz, Duck, and... Or, sorry, Ducky. Oh, boy. <laughs> I'm gonna start over. Okay. From a china cabinet across the way, Giggles, Buzz, Ducky, and Bunny observe her holding the key. We have to get that key. It's the only way inside the cabinet. You can't be serious. <laughs> How are we supposed to do that? <laughs> I tried. <laughs> it's great. That's you. Oh, oh, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Too many characters already. Okay, wait, hold on. <clears throat> you can't be serious. How are we supposed to do that? You know what? Leave that to us. We know exactly what to do. Moments later, Margaret wanders down the aisle. Notices the stuffed ducky and bunny posed on the shelf. Oh, where did you two come from? Wham! Ducky and bunny clamp onto her face, not letting go. 
And I say that that loud because there are several exclamation points at the end of that sentence. <laughs> All right, this is both of us. Yep, ready? Yep. The keys. The keys. Hand Hand over, over, lady. lady. The, the, the keys. Give me. Give me. They're the keys. Give us the keys. Get up. <laughs> Cut to reality. The toy's still hiding on the cabinet as before. Well, we're not doing that. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Too visible. Good point. That's a good point. Something more subtle. Ooh. Uh, what about winner, winner, chicken dinner? Yes. Ooh, page turn. <laughs> <laughs> Page scroll. <laughs> oh. Replay imaginary? Of, of the, yeah. Replay of the imaginary plan. Again, Margaret walks down the aisle. This time, a baseball rolls across her path. She investigates where it came from. Wham! Duck and bunny on her face again! <laughs> the, 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 the keys! keys. Oh, give us the key! Where are they? Give us the keys! Give us the keys! <laughs> Back to reality. Uh, you're kidding. Really? Okay. Okay, you you just, all right, well, uh, oh, what about the old plush rush? There you go. (laughs) Another imaginary plan. Margaret again walks down the aisle, turns toward the shelf, and nothing. Takes the money from the cash register. Backseat POV of Margaret driving home that night. She checks her rearview mirror. Nothing. Ugh. Back to reality. Giggles is impatient. Where is this going? Shh. Don't interrupt. (laughs) Did I say that too much like buzz? I felt it was too raspy. Let me do it again. (laughs) It's hard to separate these characters. I know, right? I am neither male. (laughs) Nor capable of multiple voices. Shh. Don't interrupt. Return to the plan. Inside of Margaret's refrigerator, as she opens the door, pulls out a dish, and... Nothing. Closes the door. (laughs) Margaret relaxes in a bubble bath, nurses a glass of wine, and nothing happens. Interior bed. Margaret snores. Slowly, Ducky and Bunny rise over her, cut wide on her house. Her scream echoes in the night. (laughs) Back to reality, Ducky and Bunny raise their eyebrows. Pretty good, right? Not gonna happen. N O. Okay, do you want the key or not? What is wrong with you? What's wrong with it's me? Like, we, we it's gave like, we gave you three brilliant ideas. It's another to offer a reason. As they continue to argue, Buzz stares hard at the key in Margaret's hand from across the way. How do we get the key? And that's the end of the scene. Yeah. <laughs> All right, well, other than our amazing voice acting. <laughs> Uh, This is probably Um, one of the most tech-heavy scripts I think we've ever read on this show. Because it really gives a lot of actual, like, camera direction. It it does all the things we're taught to do in school that nobody does anymore. Like, Mm. like there's a cut to. People hardly ever use those anymore. Yeah. They all caps a lot of things, which are indicators for the post team. Mm. Mm -mm. Like, they all caps their props that are relevant. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, they all caps when they're separating from reality to the, like, imaginary plan. Right. It's, it's a highly technical script, which makes sense because, you know, it's an animation, so they have to literally make everything. Yeah. (laughs) From scratch. Right. It does exactly what it shows in, in the movie. Um, which it's like, I, I was just really wondering how they wrote it to to be, like, back and forth. Yeah. Um, between reality and, like, the plan. Right. Um, but it was it was pretty easy to, to follow along. I mean, granted, they do say, like, reality and a replay of the imaginary yeah. scene or imaginary plan. I thought it was interesting, the montage parts, even. Like, especially mm-hmm. the third plan. Oh my god, might I just say, I love the the conscious naming of the plans, again, like, in the comedic writing sense of, like, let's subvert the audience's expectations. Like, the first plan, the title of it, you already know where we're heading. Mm-hmm. The second plan, we we make it sound like something really new and different, 
and it's not. Yeah. And that fucks you up. And then the third plan, it's like, oh, great. This is just going to be the same thing as the first plan and the second plan. But then they're like, It just drags no, on. We're going to drag it out. <laughs> we're going to make it seem like it's something really special and different. And at yeah. the end. <laughs> Which it's, it really is um, interesting, too, because they they dragged it out so much that... Um, you know, we we actually see what kind of person Margaret is. Yeah. Like, a little bit more than we thought we were going to actually know about her. Yeah. Of, like... I love her okay, drinking she's... wine in the bubble bath. Yeah, Like, she's exactly. this old, like, what? She's probably in her 70s, 80s. Seven, yeah. I'd say 70s at least. Yeah. In the comfort of her home, and she's snoring. She's deep asleep because she's snoring. Yeah. And then all of a sudden... You just <laughs> see them creep up. Yeah. And the best part is that they don't... They There's no, like... They don't ru- ruin the tension in the scene by mm-hmm. letting you see them attack her again. Instead, right. they cut to that wide shot outside. Yeah. So that you, it's implied to the audience what, what's happening. We know because we've already seen it. Mm-hmm. But it does something different than the last few scenes, which allows the tension to, like, really be impactful. Yeah. And it is so funny. <laughs> Because all we hear is her screaming. screaming. <laughs> so it's like, we know exactly what's happening. We're just not seeing it. Yeah. But it's a payoff that... Oh, okay. There it is. I think it's a stronger payoff than if they actually, like, showed them attacking her again. Because we've yeah. already, like, seen that. We've seen it twice before yeah. in in very close proximity to this one. So yeah. it's like, yeah, it makes sense that we we are cut away from that. Yeah. So. When I watched the scenes with them, it was, like, it was so much better than I even imagined. Like, because yeah. I watched the teaser with them in it and I thought, are their characters even relevant? Like, why are they here? What purpose do they serve? Like, they're totally new characters. Yeah. They have nothing to do with the previous, like, plot. They aren't someone we really know. Mm -hmm. But in the movie, they are, like, just the fantastic comedic relief that you need. Mm -hmm. Um, And they do help push the main characters and main cast in, like, the right direction, but also create new challenges that are entertaining. Mm -hmm. Do you know how, like, when when stars get really really big all of a sudden like everyone wants to grab a piece of that um I was just really hoping that that wasn't this situation yeah and I was really hoping that that they were gonna have just enough screen time to be funny but still focus on the toys that we really came here for yeah and I think that they did a really good job with dividing up that that comedic yeah. Timing with, um, especially with, um, with Buzz, when he gets stuck up on the, on the prize thing, mm-hmm. and, like, you know, they're, at first they're, like, hassling him and whatever, but yeah. then, you know, he, <laughs> he's easily, like, you know, getting back at him, and, like, I don't know, I, I think what they, how they put these two characters into the movie really, really worked. Yeah, it didn't hurt the plot at all, mm-hmm. it didn't... It didn't feel out of place. Like, it Mm-mm. was... And the whole... Like, this is very much an ensemble, right? No, oh, yeah. Which is weird because I think, like, the first movie felt like it's really more about these two characters and they happen to have other characters that are more in the background. Yeah. You know? And then I just feel like as Toy Story has grown, it's become very... Like, more and more you start caring about all of, all of these characters in the universe and not just the two main ones. Yeah. Um... <clears throat> if anything, I'd say, like, Buzz really took a back seat in this movie. I love Buzz as a character. I hate it what they did. Oh, in this his, movie. Yes. Ryan said the same thing, like, I, when we were watching it. He I didn't like it. I don't understand why. Well, I think, and I could be wrong, like, I don't work for Pixar, but, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> but I will say that... <clears throat> I do think that audiences, especially young audiences, which let's remind ourselves this is for kids, were extremely receptive um, in the, was it the second one when he gets reset or something? Oh, the third one. Oh, the third one. Mm -hmm. So I think people were really receptive to like classic Buzz antics. And so they were like, okay, how can we make Buzz like more stupid? Because people thought that that was really funny and enjoyed it. And then they didn't, the problem is in this movie, it wasn't plot relevant, right? Like, in that movie, they were like, okay, something happens that gets him back to his original default settings, Mm -hmm. and so he acts like classic Buzz, and people get to enjoy that part of him that they had so much fun with in the first movie. Yeah. Um, But then, in this movie, it was like, 
look, we don't know how to work this into the story, but Buzz is just going to kind of act like a weird idiot for the entire yeah. film. <laughs> like, like I... why? Like, he knows he's a toy. He knows that he's pre-programmed, like, his settings are pre-programmed with those default voice activations. Why he would listen to them and be- truly believe that they are a code by which to live. Well, and then, I don't know, maybe maybe it was something that we missed in the movie, but maybe something was said of, like, well, after I got reset, things just haven't been the same. If that was said, then I'd be a little more, like, eh. Yeah, I don't know if I'd love it if he said it, but it could be funny if one of the other characters, like, made a comment of, I don't know, he really has never been the same since he got reset. Exactly. Like, like then it could have been comedic. Yeah, yeah. and then that could explain, oh... That's yeah. why he's like, listening he's to his... gone a little crazy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But to my recollection, I don't think that anything was said like that. And which is why I think that's a problem that I'm having. And it's like... Yeah. But Buzz was such... He was the one who's who's changed the most. Yeah. We see him as someone thing. who's become much smarter and more self-aware. And then having him listen to that voice box is like... Basically knocking down everything that changed and grew about him over the yeah. past several films. Yep. And then finally at this one, like, the yeah. person who grows and changes in this one is Woody. Yeah, I almost think that, like, it's funny because... And and again, what you're saying is that in this movie, this doesn't apply. Mm-hmm. But up till now, it very much felt like we started off with Woody being the straight man and Buzz being, like, the goofy comedic character... Like, the lighthearted one. Mm-hmm. And then we watched that shift, I feel like. In the third one, it felt like Buzz started getting... Or maybe the second. I don't know. Buzz was more smart. He was more calculating. He was a leader. You know? And then when this came, it was like... This was the opportunity to see Woody be, like, hopeful and reminiscent of his past self. And wanting to have fun and freedom that he doesn't have in his life. And for Buzz to be, again, like, the straight man. To be... Like, the serious one who's like, look, we just need to do what we need to do to get back to Bonnie, and I want to make sure that you get back there. Mm-hmm. Um, which he kind of did, but again, then we Not played... in the way that I feel like could have been more impactful. Yeah. Like, the thing that that I... And I feel like this is kind of like... This has changed ever since I realized the, um, the Pixar theory, or the mm-hmm. Pixar formula, sorry, of... Um, like, this is the way that they write their, their scripts. At least most of the directors and writers at Pixar, this is how they write their scripts um, and tell their stories. At the end, it it didn't hit me as much as Toy Story 3, Coco. Um, Finding Nori, was, I, I did get teary-eyed a little. Um, but this one, like, I should have felt more emotional on Woody and Buzz saying goodbye to each other. Mm -hmm. Because we've seen them for four whole movies. Yeah. And Buzz, yeah, he... If it wasn't for Woody, Buzz wouldn't have known that he is a toy. Mm -hmm. And he wouldn't have had this relationship with with Woody and with Rex and Ham and all of the other characters. Mm-hmm. Um, who knows if him and Jesse would have even become a couple because he would have just been stuck in his, you know, space ranger mind. Yeah. Um, so he would have missed out on a lot of things. And it's like, I should have felt that emotion behind yeah, that. The that, impact. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But I didn't. I mean, I agree. Um, but I also feel like the ending in this is not sad so much as it is like hopeful yeah i know (laughs) which is like here's what i do like about it and i don't get me wrong like i agree with you i i do think for those of us that have the nostalgia factor of having watched it since we were kids and growing up on it and knowing these characters for such a long time you would expect that to be a pivotal emotional moment and to feel something really strong that you didn't Mm -hmm. and i understand that disappointment But I also feel like for kids now, right, for the current audience, what was important about it is um, Woody felt so committed and so strong about the purpose of a toy is to do this one thing. Like, we, we can't, we don't exist. We're not important unless we're helping the kids. Right. Unless we're 
belonging to a kid and giving them our all. Mm -hmm. And then by the end of the movie, he realizes that having your own independent happiness and, and pursuing a life with a partner who you care for and being together and enjoying doing things that aren't necessarily exactly what you wanted to do for yourself originally can also be very fulfilling Mm -hmm. and special in its own way. Yeah. True. I liked it. And I think it speaks a lot about adult relationships too. Like the compromise of what you want is just as important as what I want and we have to meet somewhere in the middle. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. For sure. Anyway. Should we watch the scene now? Yeah, we should watch the scene. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to die laughing. I love this scene. Okay. We'll, we'll be right back. This podcast is brought to you by Arizona Studios. Arizona Studios, a full-service video content specialist. We're here to illuminate your message and compel your audience to take the right action. For more information, head to our website at arizonastudios.com and be sure to tune in for more content on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. I wanted to see what the what the ending one. What do you mean? The um at the end where <laughs> where uh, they they all of a sudden have like laser eyes and <laughs> it's just like completely like another plan. Yeah, yeah. but it's but it's not. It's just. Um, shit. It's this just, is, it's, this it's is complete... an after credits, right? I is think it, so. Like it was an Easter egg. No, it's um, it's all the way at the end. Um... Oh, okay. So it is in the script. Yeah. Also, I wonder about that, right? Like we haven't come up across a film yet where we check to see, like, do they write the end credit scene into the script? Oh yeah. Like I've never come across that yet. Actually, yeah. Here, let's see. Um, are we rolling? Oh, okay. Yeah, we're rolling. Okay. What page um, are we on? Uh, all the way at the end, one twenty, right there. Um, <clears throat> so back at the Star Adventure booth, a long line of kids set up, shoot, miss, win a prize, repeat. The Carney's still oblivious. Um, dissolved tonight. The clueless Carney now leans against the completely empty booth, behind the counter. The Toys Rescue Gang conference. Woody, all right, nice job, gang. Bo, every prize with a kid. Giggle McDipples, what's next? Ducky, leave it. Leave that to us. Bunny, we know exactly what to do. <laughs> More end credit cards. So yeah, so right there yeah, is, you is know, the insert. end credits, and then they add the scene that is the Easter egg. With yeah. The... <laughs> so then it continues with um, exterior Star Adventure booth night. The carny yawns, turns back to the booth, shocked to see that it's empty of toys. He leans over the counter. Ducky and Bunny attack to his face. Plush rush. Ah, ah, you got plush rush, son. <laughs> I like that they wrote that sentence into the yeah. script. <laughs> <laughs> the carny panics, rips rips the plush's dolls off of him. Bunny shoots lasers from his eyes at the carny's feet. Ducky, dance, ha ha, dance, get your knees up. Let's see those feet move. The carny runs. Ducky and Bunny hulk out, laughing maniacally as they grow and f- grow to full kaiju size. <laughs> Stomp after him, firing lasers, breathing fire. Back to reality. Still behind the counter. A normal size Ducky and Bunny make la- laser noises as the toy gang <laughs> stare at them unfazed. So yeah, so, so funny. And that it just keeps on going a little bit. And then at the end of that little segment more end credit cards yeah so yeah so this i think they yeah they definitely put that into their into the script they Mm -hmm. plan their easter eggs yeah that's cool the um which i mean i assumed that they have to write and plan the easter egg but i hadn't thought about how that was written into the script yeah but it's awesome something that really caught my eye like just so that y'all know um when i was looking at the credits at the end I did see a familiar name pop up um, under the writing credits. Um, Oh, my God. Writing credits? Rashida Jones. Oh, yeah. She was a part of the writing staff on this. And I thought that was nuts. I was like, holy shit. Like, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. Um, And that just, you know, because she's such a popular actor right now, it hadn't occurred to me that she writes. And then on top of that, to be on 
right on, on the writing this. staff for such a big franchise. I right. was like, that's awesome. Yeah. Um. But yeah. Well, and yeah, like how much of that was her? Oh, well, that's the crazy input. thing is there's so many writers listed, which to me feels. Oh, I I have no idea. Like, like, oh. look, we're used to seeing writing staffs on um on series work. Like when you're talking about a series, you typically have like you have a creator, and that's a person who typically writes the pilot, and they will oftentimes, it very commonly direct the pilot. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you'll have a writing staff that helps write the other episodes after that, and sometimes your creator will hop in here and there, um, like on big key pivotal story episodes Mm -hmm. um that's pretty common practice to my knowledge i was surprised at how many oh look she worked on she did a voice in inside out so i guess maybe she has buddies over at pixar or she just hangs out there maybe that's the trick to success is if (laughs) if you're just an actor and you hang out over at pixar eventually they'll give you a job doing something um yeah I mean, original story. Like, I I just wish that we could see, like, which part or how how much much of of it was her idea. Um, I mean, and... I mean, I'd love... Not just her, but, like, all the other people's. Like, Andrew Stan, I'm a big, big fan of Andrew Stan. Um, I'd love to see this. Like, this group of writers on a panel would be dope. Yeah. I mean, but there's so many of them. There's a, like, what? Okay. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. There are ten people credited for the story. And of those, only two of them were the screenplay. And the other eight are listed as original story. And, I yeah, I can't help but wonder how much of that. Like, what does that mean? Like, Mm -hmm. does John Lasseter have a credit just because he made these characters does he have a credit because he actually wrote portions of this particular story right did they go to him as a consultant for certain things Mm -hmm. you know these other writers what portions did they actually come up with i it's yeah it is interesting like we watched um i like watching shows and and podcasts that give me insight into television creation specifically um, but recently, I watched the um, featurettes for Steven Universe, the movie. Oh, yeah. Um, and what was interesting is, I always expect with a series that there's going to be multiple writers. Mm-hmm. But what was cool is watching them, like, get the group of people together to write just the outline for the movie mm-hmm. was, like... I mean, there were, like, five or six people in that room. Mm-hmm. And they all went on a trip, and they, like, hung out at some cabin or something, who knows. And they, yeah. they sat and wrote the outline for the movie, and then mm-hmm. they started scripting it. Um, and obviously, with animation, it's kind of different, because in certain animations, they do the, the storyboards first, and then the script, or, you know, they just do the boards, or it just depends on the show or movie. Mm-hmm. Um Obviously, given that this is, like, a Pixar thing, I assume that they do the boards and script in... In unison. In unison, like, at the same time they're yeah. writing both. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> but who knows? Yeah. I need to borrow that, by the way. Oh, the movie? Yeah. Yeah. Just for the features. Yeah, they have... They actually have, like, the pitch meeting where Rebecca Sugar pitches... The, the complete movie, like, entire plot beginning to end with animatics, they have the entire thing oh, wow. on the features. Like, you're basically watching the whole movie, but the whole <laughs> but movie is Rebecca a... doing all of the voices and pitching the idea. Jeez. It's, it is, it's fun. It's not, yeah. like, a easy watch. Like, it is, like, a set some time aside, aside right. yeah, type yeah, of yeah. thing. Yeah, yeah. But it, it's cool. Like a Friday night watch. You're not going yeah. anywhere. Uh, I mean, you're not going anywhere anyway. Yeah, but... right. <laughs> Hello, quarantine. <laughs> yeah. Did we yeah. mention we're on quarantine? Anymore? Yeah, right. <laughs> um, anywho, but back to Toy Story. Like, to have that many creators involved is just bazonkers. Because, I mean, I get flustered. Like, every time I write a script, I have probably a good, like, four or five people read it before I say, okay, this is done. Mm-hmm. Um, and that alone is exhausting because everyone has different opinions and ideas. Like, mm-hmm. there is no one thing we all agree on, ever. Like, yeah, there's, 
It's just, you know, and it's like great to get those. It's important to get those creative ideas and see different perspectives to amplify your work Mm -hmm. because a lot of good insight comes out of that. But at the end of the day, there has to be one person at the top who can say, yes, 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 that's going to work. No, I can't do that. Like, you know, because you can't fit all of those ideas together (laughs) and it work. (laughs) Yeah. I feel like that's probably where I struggle with um, (laughs) any time, like, it's asked of me to read a script and give feedback because it's like, I thought it was good. Okay. What else? It's like, uh, here's my problem with the feedback. I thought it was good. Is it's like, even if you don't have a criticism, like Mm -hmm. let's say that you thought it was perfect. Everything about it totally worked for you. Mm -hmm. There's still, there's still something that made you think it was good, right? Like Mm -hmm. something in there made you feel something that was positive for you. Yeah. What was it? Like, you know what I mean? Like it means something to be specific, even, especially for writers who are struggling with like, if I've gotten feedback from six other people and half of them hate it and half of them really liked it, you could be that determining factor of what do I do with this? Because right. if you if you can explain why you liked it or what you got out of it, that can tell me, okay, or even if, uh, if you got something out of it that isn't what I was going for, right? Like mm-hmm. as a writer, if I was going for one thing and you really liked it, but you thought that what I was going for was totally different, mm-hmm. then that could be a conflict, right? Like you yeah. enjoyed it, but you didn't get the point. So right, yeah, am yeah. I successfully writing it? Maybe not. Yeah. You know, or I'm okay with going in a totally different direction, knowing people won't get whatever it was I originally intended. Right. Um, one thing that Matt had me, um, like do for like when we were still in school, Mm -hmm. um, anytime he would show me something he was working on, he wouldn't ask me, what do you think? He would ask me, what do you see? And so then I would present, okay, well, I see this, um, I see this happening, blah, 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 blah. I'd talk about what it is that I am visually seeing and, um, and then that would then in, in turn, like, go to, well, I like the way that you did this, um, you know, or blah, blah, blah. Are we talking about scripts or what are we talking about? We're talking, I'm just talking about, like, visual things. Okay. Like, because Matt's a graphic designer. Which so which I get. It's yeah. just when we're talking about scripts, I'm like, okay, but, but this isn't... But if anything, instead of asking how how did you like the script, yeah. instead maybe present the question of what did you read? Or yeah. tell me about the script that you just read. Yeah. Instead of like, what is it that... Like, instead of yeah. just asking, like, did you like it? Did you not like it? Like, yeah. That's just a way like try to, to get see if more... you can get a clear answer of what happened in the plot. Did they understand it? Did they get all of the character nuances I was going for? Yeah, yeah. if they're able to, um, if you're able to explain it the way that that the writer intended. Yeah. Okay, great. The, if whatever they you did can't, worked. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. If they can't really explain it, or if they like have trouble like recollecting some things, then it's like okay, that that, that needs to be. Yeah toned up a little bit that's valid i like that See? we'll take that into our next next guest a, writers i had a point Plot to that. <laughs> i didn't think you didn't have a point okay Aww, so on the subject of oh, uh, right of this script yeah i mean i think it's pretty pretty tat for tat i mean if anything just watching it animated obviously there's some nuanced things that aren't in the script like i noticed that in the in the first imaginary attack plan, like she looks, she sees them. We as the audience don't see them. And then suddenly they've lunged out and jumped at her face. Hmm. And the second one, they add more of a pause by having her look into the cupboard where they're hiding. And then we see her over the shoulder of them looking back at her and their eyes are like glowing <laughs> in a creepy way. And then they lunge back, lunge out at her. Yeah. So it's like they added just a little bit more information so that for for just that extra second you think what's going to happen what's different than the last one and yeah then, and then they attack her and, and it's, it's like nothing's exactly, different yeah. it's exactly the same plan <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um yeah no i i enjoyed this scene this one's probably like one of my favorite 
scenes. In the movie or just in general? Um, probably in general. Yeah, it's so funny. I I really enjoyed the scene a lot. Well, and then I also was really upset, like, because part of this scene is in the trailer, kind of like how you were saying of, like, is this going to be not funny when I watch it in the movie? Or is it going to be just as funny as me watching the trailer for the first time? I mean, it. It's. I still laugh at it. I mean, yeah, we've watched <laughs> this scene many times, yeah. and we still think we're it's still funny. We're still laughing, so it's like it. It's. It's a good, a good, um, good scene. But yeah. also, I think one thing that you had said um, when we first picked this scene was that it's a good show of um, thirds. Oh yeah, and also the whole like subvert your expectations yeah um but the the thirds one is very i mean they both they both work together the thirds and the subvert your expectations the rule of thirds in writing is go ahead oh oh okay um so you like this one you tell people this one a lot i do yeah you do i've watched you give this feedback quite a bit oh okay um if you're going to do something to pay off in a great way at the end you want to do it in thirds. Another example that I can think of off the top of my head is um, in Princess and the Frog. Mm-hmm. Um, when, ugh, spoilers, when Tiana first <laughs> turns into a frog, she's like, ew, I'm all, I'm all slimy. slimy. And... Um, the mucus bit. Yeah. And yeah, and as so... As soon as you said yeah. Princess and the Frog, I knew where you were going. Yeah, oh so God, then the Naveen... Naveen says, it's not slime, it's mucus, and late, like, maybe, like, ten minutes later, um, you know, Tiana says again, get your slimy hands off me, and Naveen corrects her and says, it's not slime, it's mucus, and then, in, like, all the way towards the end, right, yeah. like, almost at the end of the film, uh, the bad guy, uh, Dr. Facilier, he mm-hmm. goes to, um... He tells Tiana, you're just going to live the rest of your life as a slimy little frog. And she says, well, I got news for you. It's not slime. It's mucus. And it's like, ah, yeah. That, yeah. that was a great payoff. Great payoff. Yeah. You want, if you're going to have a joke like that or some sort of big payoff, it's more rewarding in thirds. Yeah. I think a lot of stand-up comedians follow this principle, too. Like, you'll notice that a lot of comedians do the bring bring up something that I already brought up earlier, but it really is like, again, if you do it in thirds, the payoff the third time is, is much, much stronger and more impactful. Like people are like, ah, that again. Yeah. So funny. Yeah. Like same with this scene in Toy Story where, you know, we build up the same bit over and over again and we slightly change it each time so that again, we're subverting the expectations of the audience to think we might do something different. So that when we do the same thing, it's even funnier. Yeah. Well, and then also, even though we've already got the payoff of the third, um, in this little short time, um, but all the way at the end, where yeah. it just goes over the top. Like, yeah. they, you know, they grow to kaiju size, and they yeah. have lasers shooting out of their eyes. Like, yeah, okay. Yeah. That's, just, that's just them being silly now. But now we've, <laughs> we have, in the previous scene, we set up for the audience, these characters are unrealistic, and they when they make a plan they're not thinking logically yeah they just think that they're badasses and that they're gonna save the day by just doing shit their own way yeah and and then at the end that makes it even funnier because it's like they really just have no sense of reality at all (laughs) like this isn't even physically possible for them to do but but they approach it in a serious way but we're not gonna tell them that yeah no we'll just let them (laughs) let them live their their fantasy yeah Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's something else we talked about when we watched the scene is, like, just the voice acting alone. I mean, yeah. how incredible the portrayal of these characters makes them much more lifelike and entertaining. And we're so sorry that you're listening to our read because <laughs> we can't do that. Yeah. <laughs> but but if you haven't, go watch Toy Story 4 because it's worth it. Yes. Yes. Uh, this has been New Script on the Block before the scene. Uh, please... Uh, comment if you'd like. I don't like that. Um. I'm gonna let this go. I wanna let it pan out. I don't know I wanna what... see where you're going with this. I, I have nowhere. You're going I nowhere? I have hit a literal roadblock. You... I Have you really, though, hit a literal roadblock? We're standing outside <laughs> in the middle of the street right yes. now. And Ashley has yes. hit a literal roadblock. Uh-huh. 
All right, this has been Before the Scene, Toy Story 4, an episode of New Script on the Block. Again, you can find us online by searching Arizona Studios on Apple Podcasts, uh, SoundCloud, YouTube, and all of the social medias. Thank you for tuning in, and you'll hear us next time. Goodbye.